Good afternoon. Uh, if you're on the East Coast of the United States, I feel like I should repeat um, uh, the remark from earlier the, uh, at the start of our conference. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you happen to be joining us. Um, we've had two strong sessions already this morning, and we're um, ready to get underway with session three of Res to Vic Lace 4. Um, our next speaker is going to be uh, Lila Ballaro. Um, Lila is a second year PhD student and Fulbright scholar at the Institute for the Study of the Ancient World, uh, NYU. She's also currently serving as president of the ISAW Student Council and an NYU uh, Social Sector Leadership Diversity Fellow. Uh, Lila gained her BA and MPhil with distinction in classics at the University of Cambridge with a focus on decolonial approaches to Greek art and archaeology. She's continuing this commitment to decolonial practice in museum spaces, working in New York and Athens, and is also developing the idea of, a black, of the Black Mediterranean as conveyed by ancient Mediterranean art. Please welcome Lila, whose paper is entitled Black Carthage, Rethinking Perceptions and Presentations of Race in the Punic City. Welcome, Lila. Thank you very much, Joe, for that introduction. Hi, everyone. Happy Friday and Ramadan Mubarak. If you're observing the holy month, I'd like to thank Hannah and Joe for organizing this and bringing us all together and my fellow panelists for sharing space with me today and also to everyone who is tuning in. Um, I know that there are lots of exciting, interesting events happening this weekend. So thank you for taking the time to listen to what we have to say. Today, I'll be talking about Black Carthage and rethinking perceptions and presentations of race at Carthage in the Punic City. In Naples, among the vast collection of Pompeian wall paintings that there are, there are two in particular that transport viewers from the shores of Roman Southern Italy to Punic North Africa. The focus of each composition is a Carthaginian woman who kills herself to protect her city at a critical point in its history. The first painting on the left is set in Carthage, and it depicts Queen Dido after Aeneas has abandoned her. In fact, his ship can be seen sailing away in the top. And this is in the moment right before she commits suicide. It featured in the exhibition Pompeii in Colour, the Life of Roman Painting at the Institute for the Study of the Ancient World, where, as you just heard, I study and I also work as a docent. This painting is therefore very familiar to me, and I have spent a lot of time thinking about it and talking about it to a wide audience, the experiences of which I will draw on in this paper. The second painting on the right is a historical one and it is set in Numidia, but it too features the suicide of a Carthaginian noblewoman, Sophonisba. Sophonisba was the daughter of the Carthaginian general Hasdrubal, who fought in the Second Punic War, and she was married to two Numidian kings, Syphax and Masinissa, the latter of whom was her true love. However, Masinissa was allied with Scipio during the wars and did not want to become an enemy of Rome by marrying her. And so he asked her to die like a true Carthaginian woman, perhaps even evoking Dido, and she did so by drinking a cup of poison. This is the moment represented in the painting. The central female figure, Sophonisba, holds a silver bowl as she leans against a man we can presume is Masinissa. Through paintings that depict these moments in myth or history, the Pompeians were clearly providing commentary on the Punic Wars between Rome and Carthage that occurred 200 years prior. And in the first century CE, which is where we are now, scenes of North African noble women committing suicide would be read as references to that most notorious North African queen, Cleopatra. In fact, the Sophonisba painting had previously been interpreted as a depiction of Cleopatra's suicide, but now the consensus is that it is a depiction of Sophonisba. The paintings are thus multi-temporal, as they refer to and evoke multiple episodes of history at the same time. However, the main characters of each painting, Dido and Sophonisba, are not necessarily the women who catch our eye. Instead of focusing on them, our attention is drawn to the women with dark skin who appear in seemingly servile positions on the left in each painting, and both of whom seem to look outside of the frame to the viewer. The presence of these figures has largely stumbled scholars since the paintings were unearthed and been largely inexplicable until now. Why would a painter choose to include a dark-skinned figure? What does it add to the scene or the narrative? The answer to the second question is nothing, 
These figures serve no nar narrative function, as no Greek or Ro Roman accounts describe someone with dark skin being present at these moments. Furthermore, as Anne Kutner mentions, there is no known genre scene for North Africans that features black servants. The presence of these figures does, however, raise some issues that we encounter when thinking about Carthage, namely that we that what we do know about Carthage is tempered by a Roman perspective, as we rely largely on Roman sources, both textual and iconographic. In this paper, I too rely on those sources, primarily iconographic, but my aim here is to examine them and to understand how and why the image they present of Carthage was formed. In this paper, I argue that Carthage was the gateway for the Romans to encounter blackness, especially through the Punic Wars, and that they came to think of Carthage as a multicultural, multi-ethnic city with a black population. Egypt is often considered the gateway to Africa for the Romans, but I'll demonstrate that Carthage was first the gateway. Once the Romans, once the Romans conquered Egypt two centuries later, Carthage as a concept became a suitable canvas on which to paint, oftentimes literally, as we can see here, their presupposed ideas about Egypt and Africa, as we see in these two scenes. I'm not arguing that the Romans thought of Carthage as a black civilization or that all Carthaginians were black. I also recognize that those who are dark skinned are still presented as an unequal minority and even in some cases as non-Carthaginian. By reflecting on the blackness of Carthage, we can also resituate it within Africa and think of it as an African, not just a Mediterranean civilization. If we are to tackle the question of blackness in, blackness in Carthage, or the potential presence of black people like these two figures, the problem is twofold. Not only do we have little primary evidence from Carthage as is, we also know very little about black communities in the ancient Mediterranean, let alone any self-representation either written or artistic from them. Again, our evidence is from the perspective of Greek or Roman authors and artists. To quote Gayatri, Gayatri Spivak, these women are the subaltern and they cannot speak. Before we proceed, we must ask, can we even say that these figures are black? We don't want to reproduce racializing stereotypes by making assumptions about their race or ethnicity based on their physical features. And yet often that is the only evidence we have. Let me offer an example from my own experience working with the Dido painting as a tour guide. On my tours, when we would get to the painting, I would ask visitors what they noticed, and often the first things they would say would be about the dark-skinned woman. The obvious and least problematic comment I heard, mostly because it's stating the obvious, is people would say that she has much darker skin than the other figures. However, it was often followed by a qualifying statement, like, and yet she is still so beautiful. Some visitors made more problematic comments about her, vis her physical appearance, such as saying that she has kinky hair. These are judgments made based solely on physical features and they are all racializing statements, reminding us of the problems of drawing conclusions about race from a figure's features alone. Another question we face is what does blackness even mean in this context? In North America, blackness has been formed in a dichotomy with whiteness, informed by the racial dynamics of Atlantic slavery in which blackness was restricted to people originally from sub-Saharan Africa. My understanding of blackness aims to move away from this binary to become broader and more inclusive. In many ways, it is closer or reminiscent of a British understanding of blackness, which has sometimes been referred to as political blackness, which has in historically included North Africans and South Asians as well. An example I always give to explain this point is that there is a women's charity founded in West London called the South Hall Black Sisters. And it was founded and is still run by South Asian women for women of color, who are victims of domestic violence. In the context of Carthage, this understanding of blackness can bypass the semantics of which part of Africa or distinct ethnic group certain figures may come from, which I find can be a futile and uninformative exercise. It can also avoid this issue of reproducing, reproducing racializing stereotypes. So where does this leave the two dark-skinned women we see in these Pompeian paintings? When I approach such figures, I like to use black feminist scholarship, especially the work of Saidia Hartman and Shelley Haley. In doing so, I posit that we can make space in our understanding of antiquity for what these figures and others like them can tell us, rather than just focusing on what they cannot tell us. But this is not an uncomplicated task. 
How do we heed Haley's now 30 year exhortation to remember to reclaim to re-empower the ancient African woman while recognizing the inequality inherent in the lack of evidence and self-representation and also inventing a fantasy that suits our interests and conveniently answers our questions. Saidia Hartman warns us against committing further violence in our own act of narration, but also asks, is it possible to exceed or negotiate the constitutive limits of the archive? As a solution to this problem, she proposes a writing practice called critical fabulation. I will aim to employ critical fabulation in the case of these two figures, using the possibilities of their stories and identities as a gateway of their own, a gateway to exploring the potentialities of blackness at Carthage. When visitors to our exhibition at Eyesore saw the dark-skinned woman in the Dido painting, many would say, she's black, so she must be a slave. This is another of their extremely problematic comments, and it is based on that same American understanding of blackness that I'm trying to move beyond. We cannot apply that to antiquity because the same association between blackness and slavery did not necessarily exist. However, we also cannot discount the possibility that the figure and the one in the Sophonisba painting is an enslaved woman. They are both depicted in servile positions. They are attending the noble women in the center, and the dark-skinned woman in the Dido painting also offers Dido an object and puts her in a functional role. Moses Finley did not include Carthage in his analysis of ancient slaveholding societies, but subsequent scholars of ancient slavery have argued that he was mistaken to overlook the Punic system, notably Noel Lenski and Dexter Hoyos. Lenski, in fact, states that large-scale slaveholding was a foundational element of Punic Carthage. Furthermore, as Hoyos argues, Carthage had potteries, foundries, dockyards, and harbors that required a large working population, which likely relied on enslaved peoples and other immigrants from Libya and beyond. And there would have been even more enslaved people working on estates in the country. The scale of Carthage's enslaved population in the Punic period is also a recurring theme in textual evidence, as it was noticed by the Romans during their encounters with Carthage during the Punic Wars. So where did these enslaved people possibly come from? Some scholars like Jean Leclerc have claimed that Punic Carthage provided black slaves to the North Mediterranean to a greater extent than Egypt, which is often considered the slave trading hub for black slaves. Because at this time, the Ptolemies had taken measures against the, ex the export of Egyptian slaves to the North. Considering all of this, a picture begins to emerge of Carthage as having a large enslaved population, among whom were probably Black Africans, meaning that it is possible the two women in the paintings represent slaves. More convincing to me, though, is the possibility that they are local women from Black communities. Punic Carthage has recently been described as a diverse and multicultural city, but a deeper explanation of what that means, especially concerning ethnicity, is hardly given. Could the dark-skinned women in the paintings be iconographic evidence of that diversity, or at least of the perception by the Romans of that diversity? It will become clear throughout the rest of my presentation that it is very likely that Carthage had a Black community among its population due to its connections with other African civilizations to the East, West, and even to the South across the Sahara. We can use the Dido painting to think about diversity at the foundation of the city. Scholarship from the last five years or so has emphasized the fact that the foundation of Carthage involved African communities, not just Venetians, and points to Numid Numidians in particular. This is supported by evidence from burials in the Tunisian Sahel. Textual sources also attest to intermarriage between Phoenicians and local Africans at the foundation of the city, not least in the story of Iabas asking for Alyssa's hand in marriage. Claudian, the Roman author, writes that even at the end of the fourth century, Carthaginian women were forced into marrying Ethiopians, producing what he calls discolor in fans, which today we might consider as mixed race or biracial children. And what about the issue of Dido and her Africanity? Needless to say, Dido, or Alyssa, was a Phoenician woman. She was Levantine, so she was not of an African race, but she is still a queen of Africa, and in her article, Be Not Afraid of the Dark, Critical Race Theory and Classical Studies, Haley presents an interesting and important way to frame Dido and reclaim her as an African woman, not racially, but ethnically, as someone who is deeply connected to African culture. She examines book four of the Aeneid when Dido seeks out a priestess on realizing that Aeneas is leaving her, 
to suggest that she was engaging with indigenous African rit rituals and that by presenting her in this way, Virgil demonstrates his own knowledge of these customs. In particular, Haley focuses on the description of Dido as having yellow hair, arguing that the specific word used, flaventis, actually has the implication of a transformation, meaning just turned yellow. She then draws a connection to a practice that still survives today in the Yoruba community of dousing your hair with yellow mud and suggests that when Dido goes to the priestess, this is what she does. This would make the priestess sub-Saharan African, perhaps even black. So if we look back at the painting, could the dark-skinned woman standing next to Dido represent the priestess? Moving into the Punic period, evidence suggests that Carthage forged connections across the African continent, which I argue would have put Carthaginians in contact with black victim, with black communities and brought black people to the city. Literary evidence certainly suggests that the Carthaginians ventured to sub-Saharan Africa, not least in the Periplus of Hanno, who supposedly sailed across the Atlantic coast of Africa in 425 BC. We can infer that he made it to sub-Saharan Africa as he mentions Ethiopians, crocodiles and hippopotamuses and gorillas, and scholars today speculate that his journey may have ended in modern day Gabon. This route would certainly have put Hanno and his crew into contact with dark-skinned Africans, and since it was also a colonizing mission, it is possible that they took some people back to Carthage with them. Furthermore, scholars now are more willing to accept that trans-Saharan caravan routes must have existed as early as the Punic and Roman periods, which would have put the Punic world in contact with black people. From the reverse perspective, Considering Carthage as a gateway to blackness for the northern Mediterranean world, we should ask, could the Carthaginians have introduced black populations to their colonies? Frank Snowden argues that iconographic evidence from Sicily demonstrates that Carthage introduced a black population there through networks of migration in their colonization. Around the time that the Carthaginians are expanding and engaged in wars with Syracuse, we see masks of black faces emerging in the material evidence. Snowden's point is also corroborated by textual accounts of the Syracusans' encounters with the Carthaginians, which I will get to in a moment. The Pompeian wall paintings do not just allude to Carthage's relationship with Black ethnic groups during the period, but also, I will argue, to interactions with Black people by Romans during their contemporary period. As I mentioned before, the paintings are multi-temporal. The paintings were produced in the first century CE, at a time when the Romans had established the province of Africa, having conquered Carthage and Egypt. The inclusion of dark-skinned figures could well reflect how the Romans conceived of the mi mixed population of North Africa during their own administrations, and have thought about how they had inherited that from their Carthaginian predecessors. They may have projected this vision onto the Punic past retroactively, and thus created an image of a timeless Africa. Material evidence found in and around Carthage from the Roman imperial period demonstrates that Black people were living in what was Punic territory before it was Roman territory. The Romans who encountered them and depicted them could thus have thought of the area as having long been home to a Black population. At the Antonine Baths at Carthage, which are dated to circa 145 to 62 CE during the reign of Antoninus Pius, two Black limestone herms can be found. They are now in the Bardo Museum in Tunisia. They are taken as commemorations, perhaps part of a triumphal monument to a Roman campaign in Africa, either Antoninus's subjugation of an insurrection in North Africa, or perhaps even Julius Maternus's earlier expedition into Africa as far as Nigeria. It is clear that the artist was making racial distinctions between the different ethnic groups subjugated, as is made very clear by the depiction of these two side by side. This increases the case that the artist was trying to portray blackness in the figure in the left and trying to portray another North African ethnicity in the figure on the right. The herm on the left has also been linked by Ben Russell to a bust in the British Museum from Utica that was described by A.H. Smith as head of a Nubian girl with the hair disposed in rows of corkscrew ringlets formally arranged, slight work and roughly finished. This bust too potentially dates to the Antonine period. What's interesting about the basilica where it was found is that the interior had lots of images of different African communities that had come under Rome's sway. 
There seems to have been a sculptural program with intended regional relevance to establish Utica as a key hub connecting all the different ethnic groups of Roman North Africa. It's therefore becoming clear that the Romans saw the North Africa of their rule as a multi-ethnic place that did include blackness. And it's seeming increasingly likely that through their art, like wall paintings and busts, they reflected this back onto early and Punic Carthage. Returning to the Dido painting, another question that has troubled scholars is, why is the dark-skinned woman, woman holding what appears to be an elephant tusk? And why is the woman to the right wearing what appears to be an elephant headdress? There is absolutely no shortage of elephants in this painting. The multi-temporality of the painting is crucial to understanding the elephant iconography. It was first interpreted as an allegory for the three continents, with the dark-skinned woman holding the tusk representing Africa, the fair-skinned woman in the middle representing Europe, and the woman in the elephant headdress representing Asia. But that motif actually doesn't emerge until the Renaissance, so it would be anachronistic here, and it also doesn't adequately address why there are elephants. Instead, we can read the elephant iconography as foreshadowing Hannibal's attack on Rome with the most symbol, the most potent symbol of that. By having elephants in a scene with Dido, it draws that connection between her curse of Aeneas's descendants and this ancestral foundational enmity, enmity between the two cities of Rome and Carthage. So the painting here is using a scene from the mythical past to reflect on the historical past. I argue that the elephants and their historical resonance is here intertwined with the race of the dark-skinned woman. The crux of my argument is that through the Punic Wars, the Romans began to think of Carthage and blackness together and to visualize Carthage as having a black population. Why? Because they came to associate blackness with elephants and elephants with Carthage, all of which comes together in this painting. The reason they came to associate blackness with elephants becomes clear when we look at other iconographic evidence from Italy that makes the connection at the time of the Punic Wars. Etruscan coins from the third century BCE depict the bust of a black man on one side and an elephant on the other. Returning to Pompeii, there is another object that depicts black men and elephants. This is contemporaneous to the Dido wall painting and suggests that the connection between elephants and blackness in the Roman period was not artificial and not restricted to one or two paintings, but widespread and ingrained. So why does this connection between elephants and blackness exist? Textual evidence suggests that Carthage employed black elephant riders during the Second Punic War. So it is likely that the Romans saw people in battle, including on their side of the Mediterranean when Hannibal advanced through Italy which would also explain the Etruscan coins that have black faces on them. This does not mean, however, that all the elephant riders were black, but clearly those that were had made an impression on the enemy. To conclude, I think that iconographic evidence and textual evidence demonstrates that Carthage was perceived by the Romans as having a black population. The connection between blackness and elephants particularly suggests that through the Punic Wars, Carthage became a gateway to blackness. Centuries later, the Romans retroactively engaged with the history of interactions between Carthage and its African neighbors at the time that they too were expanding and encountering different African communities. Beyond Roman perceptions, we can reasonably say that Carthage had a long-standing black population. I don't see a reason for the Romans to have invented that and the evidence is widespread enough. I have established this much. But returning to the dark-skinned women in the Pompeian wall paintings with which I began, I'm still unable to fully establish who they were, where they were from, or what their role was in Carthaginian society. Opening the possibilities and potentialities of their identities, as I've done here, can be enough. That is the aim of critical fabulation. We do not want to fantasize or enact further violence, and yet we want to shed light on the presence and involvement of Black and other underrepresented racial groups in the ancient Mediterranean world. It's a delicate balancing act, and my goal has been to demonstrate how it can be done in an ancient context, and that the act of doing it can be enough. It can, in fact, be a radical act of empowerment and reclamation. Thank you.